was me and Johnny doing a spot of fishing in the far north of Norway and helping the local fishermen to unload their catch. You can see how we got on later on in the programme. But first, we've got some important news for animal owners. This next Saturday, a new law comes into force. It's the Animals Act 1971. And I think it's vital that all pet owners should understand what it means. And that means us, of course, as well. The new act is that from Saturday, People who let their pets stray on the roads can be sued for damages if the animals cause an accident. And if you live in the country and your dog chases sheep or worries cattle, it means that the farmer can sue you as well. Uh, I think it's very important that this particular act has been brought in for all animals, not just dogs, whether they be sheep, cats or whatever, because uh, each year, for example, with dogs alone, there are over 450 people killed or seriously injured in road accidents involving dogs. Yes, and the other year, there were 2,400 road accidents caused by stray animals. Well, I only hope that uh, Shep here becomes as well-trained as Petra, and Petra, fortunately, has never caused an accident, and I'm certainly going to make sure, or do my best to make sure, that little Shep doesn't either. Hey, it looks as though he's grown quite a bit, Johnny, so you think it's time we weigh and measure them again? Oh, I think it is, isn't it? Come on, lad, stand up. There we go. Well, there on we the go. 16th of September, he was 13 inches high. I've got it marked on this measuring stick, and when he's stand. standing there and ignoring me, right. we'll get it in again. Right. Right. I've got a ruler here to line that up. And so the 27th of September, that line is, and he's increased one inch and six tenths, 1.6 inches. So he's 14.6 inches tall. Right. Well, he looks like he's put on a bit of weight as well, John. I think he has. Well, 13 I weighed, pounds on the 16th of September. I weighed myself just before Blue Peter came on the air, and I weighed 10 stone, one pound. So now the pair of us together, you weigh he's still, he's 11 boy. stone, oh. two, two and a half. Two and three quarters. No, 11 stone and three pounds. So Shep has now weighs one stone and two pounds. That's an increase of three pounds from the last time. That's yeah, tremendous. He's yeah. You're feeling quite heavy as well. He's looking very good. Oh, and a big yawn. Well, uh, I don't know where Val is. I don't think she got up this morning. I think she's still in bed. Well, I'm actually sitting in the very latest kind of a bed. It's a four-poster bed, but actually the idea isn't a new one because four-poster beds have been around now for about 500 years, but they're coming back into fashion, and this is the very latest 1971 style. They're called four-poster beds, of course, because of the four posts at each corner, and in the olden days, when houses and castles used to be very drafty, they'd have great big heavy curtains all the way around which you could draw to at night so that you could sleep nice and snugly and warm. Today, of course, that's not so necessary, so there's just a rather nice, delicate, flimsy drape here at the corner. I think they're very attractive indeed, but the snag is, of course, they do take up rather more room than the ordinary bed, but still, they've got quite a long way to go before they beat the record of this one. This one is the Great Bed of Ware. It was built in 1580, and with room for eight people at once to sleep in it, it's the biggest bed in Britain. The Great Bed of Ware is so colossal that it can't be moved from its home in the Victoria and Albert Museum. But just to give you some idea how enormous it is, we've built our version of the Great Bed of Ware here in the studio. And you can see that John and Pete look really quite lost in it. Well, it's 10 feet 8 inches wide, that's 3.25 meters, and 11 feet 1 inch long, that's 3.9 meters. And it was built for the Fanshawe family, who lived in Ware Park in Hertfordshire. There, I think there were, what, eight in the family altogether, so presumably they all slept in the one big bed. Well, eventually the great bed of Ware was sold to an inn in Ware, where it became a tremendous attraction. And all the people who used to sleep in it used to carve their initials all round the bed just to prove that they'd slept in it, and they're still there. What, well, the people are the initials? Not the initials. <laughs> and there's a story that in 1689, 26 butchers and their wives slept in the great bed of Ware for a wager. Well, I reckon it's a bit hard to believe that 52 people actually got a good night's sleep, even in this large bed. But mind you, with the three of us in here, there's still a lot of room. So we've uh, invited to try it along for size the BBC rugby team. That's enough to frighten ITV to death. Well, there are 15 of them, and with Val, Pete and myself, that makes 18 to try and get in this bed. Are you ready, fellas? All in! There you go! <laughs> 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 you go next. Oh, okay. <laughs> next. 
next. Uh, I'll jump a bit. I'll jump a bit. Oh, shove up, shove up. Somebody's got bony knees. Right. <coughs> well, we're we we're in. just about made it. That's 18 of us in our version of the great bed of wear. We're not all uh, in the correct direction, of course, but at least we're all in. Well, of course, a big question comes now. Uh, say, in the middle of the night, you all want to turn over. Let's see if we can turn on the count of three. One, two, three. Turn! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Val. Well, that just proves you can get 18 bed people into the bed, but uh, I don't think they'd have a terribly good night's sleep. And thank you very much indeed, the BBC rugby team, for coming along and helping us with our experiment. And if you'd like to see the great bed of wear for yourself, you can, because it's on permanent display at the Victoria and Albert Museum here in London. And the BBC rugby 15 are on permanent display on Saturdays at Motspur Park. Hooray! Well, I think four poster beds are really rather attractive, especially with the canopies and the frills and the curtains. And I thought it might be rather a nice idea to make one for a doll. And this is it. It's done in very pretty pale pink and white flowered material. It's got a lovely fringed laced canopy around the top, a matching bedspread, and lace again around the bottom. And I think if you went to buy something like this in the shops, you'd pay quite a lot of money for it. But I wonder if you can guess what it's made out of. Just an ordinary old shoebox. Take the lid off, keep that because you are going to need that, and cut about half of the shoe box off. It's just a little bit high as it is. Cut that all the way around until it's about that size, like that. And the next thing to do is to turn it upside down and make four holes in the corner for the post. You can do this with a pair of scissors. It doesn't matter if it's a rather ugly hole because it won't show. But just be careful when you do this that you don't cut yourself. And the last one there. Oh, it's a bit stiff, this one. That's it. And just wiggle the scissors around a bit so that you open the hole up. Now, for the posts, I've used plain, ordinary dowling. And you can leave it the ordinary colour if you want, which is sort of natural wood, but I painted mine white. I think it looks rather prettier. And the height really doesn't matter. It's just high enough so that your doll can get into the bed, but it is important that they should all be the same height, otherwise you'll have a lopsided top. And you then put some glue into the corners here, a little bit in there like that, and a little bit this side, some down there, and a little bit in there. Turn that upside down again, and put your four pieces in like that, sort of holding them against the glue as you do, so that they stick to the side, like that and in there. And it's quite a good idea at this point to put this away somewhere so that it does really dry. And while you're doing that, you can make yourself the foot and headboard. And these are just made out of ordinary bits of card like this. I've actually shaped them, as you can see, along the top to look rather pretty, and I've covered them with white sticky back plastic. The headboard is rather taller than the footboard, like that. And you would stick those on. I've actually got one here that I have already stuck on where the four posts, in fact, have dried nicely in position, like that. Now, the next thing to do is to cover round the side with a very pretty frill. And cover it like that, all the way around, making sure that it does overlap a little bit, like that. Quite important, and lace around the bottom. And it's quite a good idea, actually, to have that overlap right round at the back so that you don't notice it, have it there. And you stick that all the way around the side by just running a little bit of glue along the top and sticking it down. And there's one that's already neatly stuck into position. Well, that's the bottom of the bed finished. The next thing to do is the canopy, and that's where you use the top of the shoe box, like that. Just fits on there beautifully. Of course, you can't leave it looking like that because it doesn't look anything at all. So you do the same thing to the top as I've done to the bottom. Cover it all the way around with the same material, just overlap slightly on the inside. And again, a little bit of lace. And with the glue, just put a little bit of glue on the top of each post, like that. And put this on top, like that. Stick it down nice and firmly. That'll stick, and you've there got your bed finished. Now, the next thing to do is to give it a mattress and the mattress is simply a piece of foam plastic like this, covered with some ordinary white sheeting, and that just slips in like that. 
I've made a pillow, which is also foam plastic, padded out a little bit with some cotton wool, and again, edged in lace, and that also goes there at the back. And at this point, I'll put the doll into the bed, like that. Uh, a little square of the same material makes a very nice bedspread, just goes over there, and again, you can edge that with the same lace, around there like that, and just hanging slightly over the sides. And I think as a very useful accessory, which you can also add, a small bedside table. And I wonder if you can guess what that's made out of. It's simply, if I can get this off, there it is, a yoghurt carton like that. And you get a bit of material that goes all the way around, seam it down one edge like that, that can go at the back, gather in the top, slip it over, lace again around the bottom, slip it over the top, the gathers there, hold it in position, and you can then put the lid back on, which holds that down nice and firmly like that, and you've got one bedside table. Well, I think that's a very nice, very useful idea for a doll, which any doll would be very pleased to have. And of course, if your doll's rather big, you could use a bigger box, smaller doll, a slightly smaller box. Like it? I think it's absolutely great, Val, yeah, super. And it's, uh, it's not a bad idea for perhaps a brother to make it as a present for a sister. Mm. Johnny and I had a go at the fishing you saw at the beginning of the programme. We flew to Tromsø in Norway, which is 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Now, fishing's a great hobby of the Norwegians, and people do it every spare moment they have. John and I had only just arrived when we were invited to see what we could catch. The boat belonged to Knut, who lent us some fishing tackle and then anchored in the middle of the fjord to let us try our luck. Fishing in Norway isn't just a sport like angling is in England. It's a much more practical thing. When you want something tasty for your tea, you just get in your boat and catch it. It wasn't difficult either. As soon as we threw our lines in the water, we both got bites and started hauling out the fish. Well, let's try again, Johnny. Fish a minute. I'd never seen anything like this. It wasn't just beginner's luck. There were so many fish, we just couldn't stop catching them. It wasn't because of expensive equipment either. All we had was a wooden frame with the line wrapped round it, and by letting go of the hook, it automatically unwound itself. We weren't the only ones, though, on the lookout for fish. We noticed all these seagulls gathering further up the coast. As there were such a lot of them, we thought something special must be happening. And then all of a sudden, they flew off and headed for this boat coming into dock. It looked just like an ordinary trawler until I noticed a lump sticking out of the side of its hull. As the dockers waited for the boat, I could see a tail sticking out of the water. Then I spotted what the lump was. It was a whale. Here at Tromsø's whaling station, they only bring in a whale about twice a week, so we were lucky to see one. Ropes were useless for pulling this huge animal up the slipway. A massive chain had to be used, which wasn't surprising when we found out what sort of whale it was. This monster of the deep was a blue whale. The chain was pulling up an animal that's amongst the largest and heaviest that's ever existed. It was about 30 metres long and weighed a phenomenal 100 tonnes. The amazing thing about this giant is, it's not a killer. For one thing, it's got no teeth, and it lives off plankton sieved through this fringe in its mouth. The blue whale is caught for its blubber. From it comes gallons and gallons of oil, and the flesh of this huge creature will provide whale steaks for hundreds. Fishing is the biggest industry in Tromsø, and just by the whaling station was the main fish dock. Here, trawlers come and go every day out to the rich fishing grounds of the Arctic. Like all trawler men, the men who work on these boats have to put up with days spent out in the freezing Arctic seas, in some of the worst weather conditions in the world. Once the ships are in, they have to be unloaded as fast as possible. This is where we could help. This huge sieve I was using washed off the salt and ice that the fish were packed in on board the ship. Speed was very important because these fish weren't going to the nearest market to sell. They were going to be deep frozen so that people all over the world could eat it as fresh as possible. Trying to pack wet, soggy place wasn't the easiest thing I've tried. By a series of conveyor belts and lifts, the fish arrived in the factory itself, where it's turned from floppy whole fish into hard-as-rock frozen fish fillets. 
Machines do all the hard work here. After the trouble I've had in my life trying to get the bones out of a piece of fish, this machine was fascinating to watch. In one fell swoop, it cut out the fillets and got rid of all the bones. This fish had come in just an hour before, so Johnny and I swapped our waterproofs for white coats and hats to follow the fish all through the freezing factory. One thing we wore that was absolutely necessary in the factory were Wellington boots. I was standing up to my ankles in bits of fish and running water. The fillets were then skinned, and by a very clever series of troughs and belts, the fish was on its way to the packers. The speed everything was done was amazing. It was only three minutes since the fish arrived in the factory, and already it was being trimmed, ready to be weighed and put into boxes. Packing the fish wasn't too difficult. The only problem I found was I couldn't keep up with the girls who were doing the weighing, and fish was piling up all round me. The fish wasn't frozen yet, but even so, it wasn't half cold. My fingers were just about dropping off, but the girls weren't bothered. They were working so fast they hadn't time to get cold. Another lot was weighed, but I was still finishing off my first packet, just the guarantee of freshness left to put in. Helga next to me was going like a bomb. When I noticed her, I felt clumsy, but never mind. At least they couldn't say I hadn't packed it properly. As Johnny filled the trays up, I took them away. Every second counted here. As soon as they're ready, they have to be frozen as quickly as possible to keep the fresh flavor. This room was full of gigantic refrigerators, each one big enough to hold about 500 boxes of fish. These fridges freeze the fish very quickly. The temperature inside is around minus 33 degrees centigrade, which means 33 degrees of frost. Two hours later, I opened up the fridge and took out Pete's tray. I had to wear gloves to lift the tray because it was so cold. If I touched it with my bare fingers, my skin would have stuck to it, and I would have had a very nasty cold burn. The boxes had frozen to the base of the tray, and a hammer was the only method of separating them. Also, the boxes of fish were now as solid as a rock, so there was no need to be gentle. A hefty clout with the hammer was what was needed. Olaf showed me that there was no need to worry about damaging the fish, so I bashed away as fast as I could. The last thing to be done was to pack them away, boxes of a dozen at a time. This trolley full was ready to go into storage to wait for the refrigerated ships to come and take them all over the world. Of course, they have to be stored in freezing conditions, and I was on my way to the coldest place I've ever been in my life. This door was the entrance to the storage area. The temperature in the factory was little above freezing, but once inside the door, the temperature dropped dramatically. Already it was down to minus 20 degrees centigrade, but this was only the corridor to the main freezer. I'd left my gloves outside, so I had to use my apron to touch the handle. The blast of cold air as I opened it was horrifying. It was minus 40 degrees centigrade in here, and the cold took my breath away. The icicles made it look beautiful, but it wasn't a pleasant experience. I was glad it was the last thing I had to do. Our working day was over, but as our stay in Tromso was a short one, we went sightseeing to see things like this bridge, which is over 1,000 meters long, and the mountains which surround the town. It was a very strange thing being in the Arctic. We didn't seem to notice what the time was. People here in Tromso don't seem to go to bed early at all. That's probably because it's so nice when the sun shines. And you might think it's early evening at the moment, but you'll be wrong, because the time is exactly 12 o'clock midnight, and that in front of us is the midnight sun. Here the sun shines 24 hours a day for nine weeks in the year and provides tourists with one of the most beautiful sights in the world, the midnight sun.
think I shall ever see anything quite as beautiful as that midnight sun. Now, if you've ever given a hand with the gardening, it's always a good idea, you know, to keep your eyes open when you're doing the digging. You might turn out to be as lucky as those boys we had in the studio last Thursday. They were the Howarth brothers who dug up a pot full of bits of silver that had lain buried for hundreds of years. On the other hand, you might end up with a collection like I've got, all bits and pieces of junk. But the interest in my bits of pieces of junk is not the value, but how they got there in the first place. For example, how did this get in my garden? It's a Chichester City Police buckle off, uh, off a belt. Now, it's quite an old one, is this, because uh, you've got this sort of fastening. It's not the modern type of buckle fastening. Now, after I dug this up, I got quite worried because I came a lot of, across a load of bones, and I thought, ho, ho, there's been dirty doings in Noakes' back garden. But I was quite relieved, in fact, when I came across these teeth amongst the bones. This couldn't have belonged to a Chichester city policeman. At least, I hope not. Uh, I think possibly it's off a cow or a sheep, maybe a deer, because there's deer around there. But there's one thing that uh, I wasn't surprised at when I, when I came across, and it was this horse brass. Now, there are lots of bridle paths around where I live, so the, there are lots of horses. And in the old days, probably, one of these just dropped off and it ended up in my garden. And, of course, uh, the, the men who live around there probably smoke clay pipes. I've also found uh, bits of pipe as well. There's this piece here with a stand, a bit of stem, but with no bowl. And then there's another one here with a bowl. All quite sort of interesting objects. But the biggest thing I ever came across that gave me a real shock was this. It's a camshaft of a, an engine. What sort of engine? I don't know. It's a four-cylinder. It's quite an old one, pre-war, I would say. And with this uh, sort of huge, great cast alloy fan, it should give you a clue. It doesn't give me a clue, but somebody might know and be able to tell me what it is. Maybe I'll uh, get it uh, sandblasted, shone up, and it would do as an ornament. It might look quite nice, actually. And that will now go in the Noakes' collection. Maybe one day I'll leave it to the nation. Who knows? Uh, we have a Blue Peter collection of things that uh, you send in to us. And this is something that's going to join that collection. Well, this is a very splendid picture of the three of us, which was sent into the office, but it's not painted, it's not drawn, it's in fact made up out of lots of bits of pieces of material. The girls of Old Catton Primary School who sent it to us say that they made it during their needlework lesson and that they were lucky enough to get the colours right because one of the girls in the class was lucky enough to have a colour television. Well, you may have noticed two differences because for our new Blue Peter season, we've got new shelves and seats. And this picture is an exact replica as the Blue Peter studio used to be. So it'll be a nice reminder for us. But the girls say they have taken the liberty of painting the back cloth a pale yellow instead of a pale blue because they said it made their picture look much brighter. It certainly does. It looks absolutely fabulous. And we're going to give Joanne, Janice, Janet, Anne and Christine, who made it Blue Peter badges. And by the way, they're only 11 years old, so I think they did very well indeed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have it framed so we could hang it in the Blue Peter office for all our visitors to see. Well, a tremendous amount of work went into it. Thank you very much, girls, for sending to us such a marvellous souvenir. We're going to be back on Thursday with one of the smallest ponies in the world. Also, you can find out what happened when I went on a pilot's course and learned how to do an emergency landing in an aeroplane. Can't wait. See you Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.